This question is a hypothesis testing question. So let's gather some information. Weekly wages in a particular industry are known to be normally distributed. So we're interested in weekly wages. Let's call that X. And we know that weekly wages are normally distributed. That's a good start. Furthermore, we know that this distribution has standard deviation of 2.1. So we know the variance of that random variable to be 2.1 squared. What we don't know is the population mean, but an economist claims that that mean weekly income in a particular industry is 72.4. Then we're taking a random sample, 35 workers, so here's our n, our sample size, and that yields an income, a sample mean, so that's the x bar of 73.2. So this is a whole set of information. We will use all of these pieces of information in a moment. Firstly, A, what null hypothesis would you specify? Well, that's here. Okay, so someone claims that the population mean, the average weekly income is 72.4. Then the next part of the question is, what should we use as an alternative hypothesis? Should we use a one-sided or two-sided alternative? Now, this question doesn't give us any further hints. So it doesn't say that the economist is, say, concerned about low wages or high wages. It just says, hey, here's my claim, 72.40. So, hey, let's test that claim and see whether the mean, the sample delivers evidence that the average wage is actually different to 72.40. So, that is A and B knocked out of the park. Now C, the actual process of performing the hypothesis test. Now there are certain elements which we need in each hypothesis test. It's the set of hypotheses, we already have them. Then following the hypothesis, we want to know which test statistic do we want to use. Now when we are testing for population means, there are basically two different type of test statistics that are in town. Either a set test which is calculated as x bar minus the hypothesized mean, so that would be 7240 here, divided by the standard error of x bar, which for that would be sigma divided by square root n. Or we are using a t-test and we're using that if we don't know the population standard deviation. And then that test looks very similar, just that we replace the sigma with s. We know what our sigma is it's 2.1. So therefore, the test statistic we are using in this test is this one, the set test. Next element for every hypothesis test is you need to know how your test statistic is distributed under the null hypothesis. So we need to figure out how Z is distributed. Now, we need to note here that X is normally distributed and we know the population variance or standard deviation. Under these circumstances, that set distribution is going to be a standard normal distribution. Sampling distribution of set is going to be standard normal, regardless of the sample size. We don't even have to invoke a central limit theorem. So that's going to be our distribution for set, given the null hypothesis is correct. So with all of this underneath, our belt, we can now figure out what how we decide what we decide regarding this um, uh, this test. Before we do that, I just want to mention that set distribution that corresponds to the distribution of the sample mean to also be a normal distribution with population mu and variance sigma squared divided by n. So that's the sampling distribution of x bar. But once we standardize using this formula here, we get that the standardized value set is standard normally distributed. Okay, so now perform the hypothesis test. Let's actually write down a decision rule. We know there are a number of ways how we can write down decision rules. One would be reject h naught if the p-value is smaller than alpha and our alpha here is 5%, so alpha is 0 
or we could use a different decision rule. We could say reject H0 if set and now we need to find critical values. So for what values of set would we reject? So we'll complete this in a moment. Let's first sketch a little distribution here. So there's meant to be a standard normal distribution for our set test statistics. So that is centered around zero. So we should reject the null hypothesis since we have a two-tailed test since we have a two-tailed test, if set is either very large or very small, how large or small? Well, the critical values are such that in the tails we find alpha over two probability. So in each tail would be two and a half percent, so together we get five percent. Now, the value which does that from the standard normal distribution, or we can look at our standard normal distribution, is for instance in the left tail we can find for a value of five here okay uh, sorry for two and a half we need two and a half percent probability in the tail so we here we have 2.4 here here it is 2.5 percent and that is at a value of one negative 1.96 so this critical value is one negative 1.96 and this one since we're having a symmetric distribution is positive 1.96. So if we find our test statistic either to the left of this or to the right of this, we shall reject. So reject H0 if Z is smaller than negative 0.96 or larger than 1.96. Or sometimes you could say it's exactly the same if the absolute value of Z is larger than 1.96. So let's calculate our test statistic. So far, up to this stage, we haven't used any information from the sample. Everything here was just the basic knowledge from the setup. So let's calculate the test statistic. Z is equal to our sample mean, which is 73.2, minus the hyper hypothesized value of 72.40, 72.40 so we already know our test statistic is going to be positive divided by sigma which is 2.1 divided by the square root of n square n is 35 divided by the square root of 35 so this is our test statistic if you punch that into your calculator or into excel you find 2.254 as your test statistic so let's use the power of different colors. So that value here is placed somewhere here. So that means it is in our rejection region because it is larger than 1.96. Therefore, we shall reject H0. So the sample does deliver us evidence against the null hypothesis. Now let's also calculate the p-value. Okay, let's calculate the p-value. Now, what's the p-value graphically? The p-value graphically is, so if here is 2.254, is the size of this tail area here, very far to the right, but added to that, the size of the mirror image tail area in the left on the left-hand side. So if we find one of these tail areas, we will multiply that with 2. So let's find that. So let's look at 2.254. Go to our normal table. 2.25. That would be what we find here. That is 2, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's that value here. 0 0.9878. 0 0.9878. That is the size of the area to the left of that. So what we have in here, the size of that area is going to be 1 minus 0 0.9878. Was that correct? 9878, that's right. Okay, which is 0 0.0122. So that's the size of this area. 
that means that the p-value is double that size because we are adding that size on the left. So it's 2 times 0 0.0122, so that is 0 0.0244. And of course we get the same decision because that p-value is smaller than alpha, which is 5%. We will, of course, also come to the same decision. We should reject H0. And how do we interpret that p-value? Well, if our null hypothesis was true, if indeed the population mean was 72.4 pounds, the probability of getting a sample mean in a sample of 35 of 73.2 or more extreme. Now, what does more extreme mean here? Here, yeah, this is 80 cents from mu, from the hypothesized population, okay? 80 cents. That means getting a sample mean that is either 80 cents larger or 80 cents smaller than our correct population mean. That probability is around 2.5%. And that is smaller than the alpha, the level we allow us to, uh, the probability at which we allow ourselves to reject a correct null hypothesis.